Well, church, we uh, ended last week with uh, Jesus' long journey to Jerusalem coming to a, a conclusion. For three years, our Lord has ministered in and around the region of Galilee. And indeed, now his earthly ministry is going to come to a close. Uh, for this chapter begins the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. So I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes from the 11th chapter of the gospel according to Mark, in the first 11 verses. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt there on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found the colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom, is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Almighty God. Though you were pleased to extend to us your hand and restore us to salvation for the sake of your Son, we continue even daily to run headlong to our own ruin. Grant that we may not, by sinning so often, so provoke at length your displeasure as to cause you to take away from us the mercy which you have exercised. Amen. Well, today marks Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And of course, this is something we celebrate every uh, Palm Sunday, the, sun, the last Sunday of Lent and the Sunday right before uh, Easter. Uh, and so this is a very familiar text to us. It's something that we've heard uh, for many, many years. Mark tells us that they approached Jerusalem actually tells us and carries with it a lot more weight than we might initially think, and perhaps even more than we assume on Palm Sunday. Indeed, when we think about the structure of the Gospel of Mark, uh, the evangelist is going to spend the next five chapters, the next five chapters on the last week, on the last seven days of Jesus' earthly ministry. That's one-third of the entire gospel is reserved for Jesus' final week. That tells us a lot of how important this is for Mark and for his readers. Not only that, this passage marks more than just the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which would culminate in Christ's passion. Rather, this event is also the coronation of, of Christ the King. So that Jesus enters Jerusalem is indeed of great significance. This is, of course, the city of David, the, the great capital of the United Hebrew Kingdom. There, David built a magnificent palace, and his son built a majestic temple to the Lord. Jerusalem was also a, an important geopolitical city. Its elevation had a, a commanding view of the valley. Its location in the arid desert made it easily defendable. It was desired by every conquering nation. The Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. 
Now, here's a historical note I found out when researching. Rome, or excuse me, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the year A.D. 70. And no Jews were allowed to resettle that area until 1919. Think about that. Now, before entering this great city, Jesus hints at his divinity. We see this throughout the gospel of these hints, these winks to Jesus' divine nature. And he gives his disciples some very specific instructions. Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt there on which no one yet has ever sat. Of course, beasts of burden, which were used uh, for rituals, often needed to be without blemish, to be pure, to be untouched. Indeed, just like today, a new car is worth a lot more than a used car, right? And so it is expected that the king would receive great honors, including the choicest of crops and livestock. And so here we see Jesus' divine nature and his role as king beginning to be made known to us. That Jesus knows such an unblemished cult is just inside the opposite city is indeed a sign of his divine omniscience. Furthermore, he says, untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Satan, the Lord has need of it. Jesus seems to expect that the disciples will be challenged. And indeed, we see that that's exactly what happens. He instructs them to say that the Lord has need of it. That's a very interesting phrase. It would tell us two things. One is that either this person who owns the cult or was asking about the cult would know about Jesus. Maybe he was a follower of Jesus and was familiar with his ministry and knew that he was coming into Jerusalem. That could be one reason. The other is, Perhaps he was guided by the Holy Spirit to recognize that when the disciples said, the Lord has need of it, that this is the king. The king has need of it. Indeed, both may be true. The disciples did as Jesus instructed, and the events play out just exactly as he described. All of this, Matthew tells us, was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet, which was say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. That quote in Matthew comes from Zechariah. And Zechariah prophesies of the messianic reign. And there the prophet gives to us four attributes of the Messiah. First of all, he is king. The Messiah is king. The Messiah is an heir to the Davidic throne. He is a descendant of God's chosen king for Israel. Second, he is righteous. The Messiah rules justly. And he inspires righteousness throughout the kingdom. Just think about that. If the, if the leadership of a country is just, is righteous, then its people are very much the same. They see the leader and they follow. Third, he brings salvation. The Messiah saves his people from sin by purchasing their redemption. That is an act that the Messiah, that only the Messiah can do. And we'll talk about that when we get to the passion. But we see that this is a chief role and lastly, he is humble. The Messiah is a servant of God Most High, submitting to his commands. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying, take this from me, yet not my will, but yours. He submitted to the will of God. And that takes a lot of humility to do that. 
And so you can see that the triumphal entry is much bigger than we make it out to be on Palm Sunday. Jesus isn't just coming into Passion Week, though that is of great importance. No, Jesus is entering as the Messianic King. This is his great coronation. When Queen Elizabeth was, uh, had her coronation back, I think, in 1952, she traveled from Buckingham Palace up to Trafalgar Square and down to Westminster Abbey in a beautiful gilded carriage. Men at arms walking before her. Such a, a magnificent sight. But what did Jesus do? He came in on a humble colt. The King of kings and the Lord of lords strolled into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. What a sign of humility. And yet indeed a sign of his ministry and the ministry that we inherit. Now, that he came in on the back of a donkey doesn't mean the people didn't know what was going on. People knew. The people saw this and they recognized exactly what was going on. Mark tells us that when they brought the colt to Jesus, they put their coats on it and he sat on it. Not only that, many, not just the disciples, many spread their coats in the road and others spread leafy branches. The people at that gate recognized what was going on. They saw that this was a sign of, of regal recognition. That the king was entering in. That these coats were laid down before him. That happened before in the Bible. The same thing happened to Jehu when he was anointed king of Israel after wicked Ahab's reign. Do you remember Ahab? That wicked, terrible king and his wife Jezebel. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13, after Jehu has been uh, coronated or has been, excuse me, has been declared an anointed king. Each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. People knew what was going on. People knew what Jesus was doing and what he represented. And so in like manner, they recognized King Jesus. Not only did people recognize his kingship, they even sang of his Messiahship. They were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing the great royal psalm of praise, Psalm 118. We know it. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That verse is used elsewhere talking about Jesus. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why do we need to rejoice and be glad in it? Because Christ is king. Verse 25, O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We, we have blessed you from the house of the Lord. These shouts of Hosanna are an echo of that phrase from verse 25. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. That word Hosanna is literally a call for salvation. It's saying, save us now, save us now. That's what these folks are crying. The salvation is through him who comes as God's anointed, coming in God's holy name. That Jesus is king is of utmost importance. You've heard me talk about his three offices, prophet, priest, and king. All three are important. All three are meaningful. Here's the thing about God's kingdom, though. We always forget this when we talk about Christ as king. The kingdom of God is an absolute monarchy. We don't live under one of those. 
but God's is. He has no constitution to bind him. He needs no consent from the governed. He is not limited by a parliament or a vote. You see, God's word is law, and he rules sovereignly. But how often do we forget that? How often do we care more about who sits in the Oval Office than who is sitting on heaven's judgment seat? Like all monarchies, honor and loyalty to the throne are very important. Yet the fundamental sin of man is grounded in our refusal to honor God as God. The chief sin of man is disloyalty and disobedience to the king of kings. Why are we surprised by this? The Old Testament points forward to the full reign of God. And the New Testament points to the coronation of that king. We should not be surprised if we have read the scriptures. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. His coronation begins on this day in scripture and his his enthronement takes place at his ascension. But here's the thing, and I think this is what trips us up. There's also a sense that he's like a king in exile. That he is crowned but not quite sitting on his throne, not quite present. What we say is his reign is not fully consummated. There's something yet to come about Jesus' kingship and his reign. This is the truth of God's kingdom. It is both already and not yet. It is not yet fully realized Because we look around us and we see that there is still rebellion and unrighteousness in the land. And we know that when Christ is ruling in fullness, there will be no unrighteousness. Yet we also know that his kingship is real because without Jesus as king, the the messiahship remains open and the prophecies remain unfulfilled and his office remains empty. And so Christ the King is necessary. It's funny that we save that day in our liturgical calendar as the last day of the church year. The last Sunday is Christ the King Sunday. That should be of prime. That should be right after Easter. Paul elaborates on the necessity of Christ's kingship in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Starting in verse 24, he says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and then every power. That's what Christ the King does. That's what he will do when he is in fullness on his throne. Is that he will destroy every opposition to God. Verse 25, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. We serve a king who has already been enthroned. But we also await his triumphal return in glory. When every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, we await that day because we know it's coming. And we await with hope and anticipation. Now going back to our story here in Mark, did you notice who was missing from Jesus' coronation? Mark makes no mention 
of the priest or the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Those groups were quick to seek out Jesus when they went to entrap him. They hunt him down. They, they run after him. They, they join the crowds every time they want to slip him up. And yet here, they're nowhere to be found. Not a word of mention. Can we think of others who have skipped out on an inauguration in protest? That the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are absent indicates a disapproval of a very clear, regal event. And you know what this was? This was an act of high treason against God himself. We get a glimpse into the mind of the crowd when they shout, Blessed is the kingdom of God. Excuse me, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. As we dive deeper into this coronation event, we begin to unfold the layers of what's going on. The priests and the scribes are absent. They disapprove of this. This addendum here was only recorded in Mark. But that fits his theme of insiders and outsiders. Who really knows Jesus? This call for the coming king of our father David reveals the true desires of the people. Peeling back another layer. What they wanted was a martial political insurgency to banish the Romans from Judea. That's what the people wanted. Politics, just like today, has always been a hot topic. The Jews had a history of attempting to shake off the yoke of imperial oppression. The Jews longed for the Messiah, not for eternal life and not for redemption from sin, but for what? For physical and temporal freedom, for rending the bonds of tyranny, for life, liberty, and happiness. Is that the Messiah you're looking for? The one to take from the rich and give to the poor? The one to disentangle us from foreign powers? Charles Spurgeon reminds us, Jesus came to save others and not to be made a king as we understand it. Yet some of those throwing palms, says the preacher, who were laying down their coats, thought that he was a temporal deliverer. Church, we must remember that Christ's kingdom is a different one from what people expect. Jesus' reign isn't merely political, but something far grander, far superior. In the here and now, in the already and not yet, we cannot assume that Christ's kingdom is paralleled in any earthly kingdom. Nationalistic religion is the error of those who are now waving palms and shouting Hosanna and then later crucify him. We cannot assume Christ's kingdom is unrealized because we can't see the throne. His delay, which only seems that way to us, is a clarion call, a call to readiness and anticipation for his return. Because church, the king will return. The king will come. And he will call forth his faithful, his elect from every tribe and nation. And they will rule in judgment with him. 
But if you are not of the elect, if you are not of the household of God, you will face the fullness of his wrath. So I ask you, church, are you living in expectation for the coming kingdom of Christ? Do you look with an eye toward heaven remembering that there is eternal life and that that is our aim and that that is our goal and that that is our promise? Not the here and now, not what happens tomorrow, not what happens today, but God's glory. Are you living as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Are you representing your king as you go about this earthly globe? Do you show forth the the mercy and compassion and love and forgiveness that our Christ has given to us? Do you owe allegiance fully to him? Are you living as a royal priesthood called by God, set apart, holy, for his righteousness, for his name, and for his sake, and for his gospel? Are you living as priests called to proclaim that good news to those around you? Are you, church? We must not forget that Christ is not only head of the church, but our sovereign. What does that word mean, sovereign? The British know what that word means, but we don't. What does it mean for God to be our sovereign king? If you are a regenerate Christian, if you are a born-again Christian, bought and covered by the blood of the Lamb, then you owe your allegiance, your loyalty, and obedience to him and to him alone. Not to him in self, not to him in land, but to him and to him alone. Mark concludes this section with Jesus entering into Jerusalem, going up to the temple and looking around at everything, and then leaving. Do you think that in that scanning of the horizon, that something was missing from Jesus' sight? Absolutely not. Jesus surveys your hearts. He surveys his church. And nothing is hidden from him. And so I ask you, when he surveys your heart, heart, what does he see? What will he find there? Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we come before you humbly submitting to your word and your will. If there is any ounce of pride in our heart, Lord, remove it, cut it out, sear it, so that we can indeed be humbled before you. Lord, we have a desire for Christ to be the center of our hearts. I ask that the Holy Spirit make that so. That the Holy Spirit open our affections to be centered fully on Christ, our King. And I pray for the kingdom of heaven to have our full allegiance and to recognize our full citizenship. For indeed, we are but pilgrims, sojourners in a foreign land. For our kingship and our citizenship is from above. And so as we toil and labor in this foreign place, 
I pray for God's sovereign rule to reign supreme in our lives. May the commands that he has given to us be fervently written on our hearts so that as we love him for his gift of our redemption, we show forth the fruits of the salvation that he has given to us, the fruit of obedience and trust so that we can bring glory and honor to his name. God, we pray all this in the name of Christ, our Savior, our King.